the chanting of dark-robed figures as they generate the power to raise the dead, the singing of the virginal choir as it generates the power to destroy the undead armies, the flash of magic from the wand of a wizard, all of these can be considered to be examples of ritual magic. When I did my video on how to create a magic system, I skimmed across these videos like a gazelle leaping across the Karoo. I would like to correct that now and delve deeper into ritual magic, what it is and how you can use it in your fantasy setting. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with Marie Mullaney. If this kind of world building content interests you, please do consider smashing that subscribe button. And if you would like to connect, I do have a Discord server, link down below. And if you want to support me in making more of these videos, hit my Ko-fi page or buy my book and more about that at the end of the video. Okay, let's get cracking. For the purpose of today's video, I'm going to define rituals to include spells as being short rituals. I'm also going to include what Jim Butcher calls cosmic vending machines, and then I guess what we would consider proper ritual magics, multiple wizards chanting together to form a greater magical effect. I'm not going to discuss runic magic. If you'd like me to discuss ruins, R-U-N-E-S, and how they can be used in magic, let me know in the comments below, and I will make a video dedicated to that. Right, let's move on. The first topic that I want to talk about in ritual magic is spells. There are two different ways to approach spell casting. Either the magic is in the spell. This is typically seen in Harry Potter where everybody says Wingardium Leviosa and you have to say the words correctly because the words are the magic. The words and even the spell gestures, the way you flick your wand. This is reminiscent of the naming style of magic, as introduced by Ursula Le Guin, where every object has a name, and if the wizard knows the name, they can manipulate the object. So it is with these spells. If you know the proper spell and the proper gestures that go with it, you can unleash the magic inside you to make the effect happen. The downside of this kind of spell is that, one, everybody knows what you're casting in-world, and from an out-of-world perspective, every spell has to be the same. It is cast the same way, so you have to design your spells in a way that fits into all situations. The other variation on spells is where the spell is personal to the wizard, and this is the system used by Jim Butcher in the Harry Dresden verse. A great example of this is Harry lights his fires with the spell Flickambicus. This is a spell that Harry himself designed when he was looking at a Bic lighter, hence the words Flickambicus. The purpose of spells in the Dresden universe is to protect the wizard as the power of magic flows through their mind. In a way, this can be seen as a derivative of prayer magic where you pray to some entity and it grants you power based on whether it is pleased with your prayer. The downside of using spells in this way is that you can't use spells as shorthand. Just because Flick and Bickus works for Harry doesn't mean that you can use Flick and Bickus every time somebody lights a fire with magic. You have to spell out what the spell means to that wizard. You also have to keep track of each wizard's spells individually for the sake of consistency and world building. So that's the two general schools of spells. How do you make spells interesting? The first thing you have to ask yourself is, should the words be in English? In both of the cases I've referenced above, the words were in some kind of derivative language, nonsense words, but with roots that we could recognize from English. Some authors like John Gwain use words that are completely unintelligible or from a language that we don't understand, a made up language. I could go for English spells personally. I think it would be great fun to have spells that are in English, but it is not a very popular format. 
Let me know in the comments what you think. Should you have English words or should you have made up words? Material components of spells can add quite a lot of value. If I think back to the Dragonlance books, one of the things that comes to mind is the constant reference to bat guano as a component of the fireball spell. Do you have the component on hand? Does it influence the spell if you introduce a substitute component that you think might do the same thing? Like instead of bat guano, you use sulfite crystals. Maybe that makes the fire hotter because it's a more concentrated form of the same component. So think about your physical components of your spells if you have any. And then your non-verbal components of your spells, like the wand flick of Wingardium Leviosa, can really help to make the spell seem more interesting and more real and give people something to do while speaking so you don't just have talking heads speaking spells at each other. And lastly, items that focus the power of the spell, like a wand from Harry Potter. Or in Harry Dresden, he has this charm bracelet of shields that allows him to focus his shielding spells to create more complex and powerful shield magic. These kinds of items can really contribute massively to the spell because what happens if the person doesn't have it? Can't they cast the spell? Is it weaker? Does the power bleed over and injure them because they don't have this focusing item? What is your favorite spell and spell system? Let me know in the comments below. So, so much for spells. Let's move on to one of my favorite forms of magic, cosmic vending machines. It is literally a recipe. It doesn't matter if the person following the recipe is a wizard or isn't. If the recipe is followed precisely, the magical effect happens. The whole ritual is the magic. You can summon old ones with it or call down the wrath of heaven without ever understanding what exactly you're doing. But how do you make cosmic vending machines interesting? With these kinds of rituals, you have a real opportunity to world build. You have an opportunity to tie back your ritual to elements of your world that you most want to highlight and to elements of your theme that you most want to highlight. Every cosmic vending machine ritual needs to include actions, ingredients, place and cost. Actions are things you need to take. You need to chant a certain chant 50 times with words you don't understand. You need to run around stark naked on the field. You need to dance under the pale moonlight with a scarecrow called Jack. Now, I've just thrown out a whole bunch of actions here, but those actions can form a core part of your world building because those actions can form the basis for myths in your world. Like, if you dance with a scarecrow, bad luck will follow you. Because there is this ritual where you're supposed to dance with a scarecrow in order to evoke the power of hell, as an example. You can use those actions to generate superstitions and myths. The same for your ingredients. You can tie those ingredients back to core elements of your world. You need the heart of a Maserox in order to resurrect somebody. And a Maserox can then be a specific animal in your world as it is in mine, where it's a giant snake. And thematically, you can make part of your ingredients combining it into your cost where you have to sacrifice your love or you have to sacrifice your childhood memories. In the Dresden verse, one of the costs that Harry's girlfriend has to pay at one point is losing a year's worth of memories. The memories that are taken from her is all her memories of Harry himself. So you can have costs that are devastating to bear and tie back very directly to the thematic elements that you're illustrating in your books. So I've spoken about cost, ingredients, actions, and the last thing is place. And of course, place can be truly great for your world building because you can tie your place in to places that exist in your world, places of power. Now, I spoke about that in my Fantasy Landmarks video, which you can check out over there. You don't want to have cosmic vending machines too easy to use. So you want people to have to struggle to get there. So you can create a place of power 
that they have to overcome multiple challenges in order to reach the place of power. And this then becomes a core part of your world where people speak in fear of the island in the middle of the ocean where the hurricanes rage around them and you need some way of taming the elements before you can even approach the island in order to cast the ritual. I must admit that I have a particular fondness for cosmic vending machines. I love the rituals around them. I love their randomness. I love that you don't need to be a mage in order to cast them. If you also enjoy this kind of magic ritual, comment below. Let me know what your favorite one is and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. And let's move on to our last form of ritual magic. Finally, it's time to talk about ritual rituals. The two authors that I want to reference here is Catherine Kerr and Jim Butcher. In both cases, you can break the ritual down into the ceremony before or the cleansing component, preparing to cast the ceremony, the actual process of the ritual and the actions that you have to take during the ritual, and finally the closing out or release of the powers that were used in the ritual. Starting with Harry Dresden, in the Dresden verse, Rituals are used when a wizard cannot summon the required focus needed for a spell or if they need to pull in multiple other wizards. Here is a spoiler warning for the first book of the Harry Dresden universe, Stormfront. In Stormfront, the bad wizard uses lightning storms as his primary generation of power and he then uses the power generated by some of his acolytes having six in order to harness that lightning storm to strike at his enemies. Harry himself doesn't like using rituals because it makes him feel awkward to go through the cleansing ceremony and dress in white and mess around with candles and so on during the ceremony itself. But he does use a ritual of invocation in order to bind himself to the island of Demon Reach where we get to see the entire process of a Dresden verse ritual. What I want to highlight from the Dresden verse rituals is that it ties back to how the magic system works. It ties back to the power source requirements, to building magic out of the energy of life. And when you're designing rituals for your world, that is what you need to keep in mind. How does that ritual tie back to your magic system and to the base rules of your cosmology? Remember Brandon Sanderson's law, build more before you build new. So let your rituals add to your magic system before you go and design a whole new system based on ritual magic. In Catherine Kerr's universe, she also builds on top of her magic system. But what I found really interesting about her rituals is that there's very little physical components. Most of the magic relies on the wizard using his imagination to build a temple of magic, if you will, in his mind, which is where he performs the ritual. So instead of having the physical world and physical limitations and fiddling with candles and so on, you build your ritual all in your mind and can hence have it be this incredible experience, a light show of colors and magic, which I thought was a great way to really bring in that true fantastical element in this ritual conducted in the mind of the wizard. Both these authors use rituals in a very plot-intensive way as well. If your ritual is interrupted, things happen to the magical forces that were there. There are consequences to that interruption. Also, while the ritual is taking place, time in the world continues to pass and things that the wizard should pay attention to happen with or without his input. So you can use rituals very intensively in your plot to create unintended consequences and to create situations that when the wizard completes the ritual, he walks into a world of hurt. What is your favorite ritual system? Tell me in the comments below. Finally, how 
do you use rituals in your world? Well, first, remember when you're building them, you need actions and you need your ingredients or your cost. And then in some cases, location also matters. Don't forget that each of these are an opportunity to world build. We spoke about rituals getting interrupted. Remember to build in that tension of time passing. While the mage is busy doing his ritual, the real world keeps on ticking and things can happen that can affect him when he comes out of the ritual. Also, what happens when he is interrupted? You don't always get perfect moments of stillnesses. And if you are interrupted, how bad can it be? Lastly, what is the effect on a ritual if you substitute components? Do bad things happen? And that is my take on ritual magic in a fantasy world. Let me know in the comments what your take is on ritual magic. I hope that you enjoyed that episode of Just In Time Worlds. If you did, please do hit the thumbs up button. It really does help the channel grow. If you want to support me in making more of these videos, you can buy my book, The Hidden Blade, or you can visit my Ko-fi page where you can buy memberships, give one-off donations, or browse my shop for more. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time World.